I'll just quickly introduce anyone. I everyone for the last part of this Fair workshop, we're going to have an yeah. interactive panel discussion. And I'm excited to have our fantastic group of panelists here, uh, most of whom presented already earlier today. So I'll be brief with the introductions, but I'll start with uh, Rowan, who is joining us here from Waymo. Uh, he is currently a staff research scientist there, uh, working on all matters on increasing reliability in autonomous vehicles, I think. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, then um, just to, to reiterate for everybody who is new in the room, um, on Zoom, we have Professor Amy Zhang, who is an assistant professor in the ECD department at UK Austin. We have Professor Chelsea Finn, who is an assistant professor at Stanford University in both CS and EE, and she's also a member of the DeepMind team. And then we have Professor Judy Offman, who is an assistant professor in, at Georgia Tech in the um, School of Interactive Computing, and she's also a member of the Machine Learning Research Sciences Center. And uh, my name is Ron. I'm a PhD student at Stanford, advised by Professor Mark Ovone, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I wanted to start the discussion here that by noting that, as we've seen today, there's a plethora of approaches at improving reliability in out of distribution regimes. And in some sense, this problem is so encompassing uh, that, you know, we we don't really have at least I don't really have a clear view sometimes of what all the different things are that people can do towards this problem and how these things relate. So at first, I wanted to start the questions and the discussion and aiming to build an overview of some of the directions in research and how they relate to each other and try to build a common unifying understanding of the OOD problem in robotics. And second, since we have representation of both industry and academia on our panel, uh, we will aim to build bridges between academia and industry, and hopefully we can we can settle on some practices that we can engage in to make sure that what we are doing in academia is actually improving reliability at scale. Uh, I have some questions in mind, and we'll also take some questions from the room uh, towards the end of the panel. And uh, without further ado, let's begin by seeing if we have consensus on what the crux of the out of distribution problem is even about. So um, I wanted to start by, by asking Chelsea a question. Um, what people consider, what even people, how people even define what makes data out of distribution often varies between the problem context and problem formalisms that uh, one chooses. Do we need more rigorous ways to quantify distribution shift? Uh, I recall in your talk, you were mentioning uh, the robot seeing a, a, a spatula and having to manipulate that. How different, does it matter? Do we need to start quantifying how different spatula is from the from the training data? You know, it seems that uh, it will be hard to measure progress if we don't have the right metrics on how far we are generalizing. You know, and maybe naively quantifying shit with say a KL divergence is not a task relevant or meaningful metric uh, when we think about objects. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, first off, I think there's actually lots of different kinds of distribution shift and two di kinds of distribution shift that I talked about. My talk one was kind of on this more semantic side where you saw new words that referred to new semantic concepts. And then on the second side, we were looking at like novel dynamics that the robot had to deal with. Uh, and I think it is useful to at least be able to have some rough categorization of different kinds of distribution shift because different approaches will work well for some kinds of shift versus other kinds of shift. And it's useful to know when an approach is going to be effective and ideally have a workflow for understanding, like if I have a training set and a test set or a training scenario and a test scenario, what sort of algorithm should I deploy? So it shouldn't be something where it's like, oh, if it's this kind of shift, you should deploy this algorithm. If it's this shift, you should deploy this algorithm. We don't know what kind of distribution shift is going to be in the data set or is going to, that the robot is going to encounter. Uh, and so we should have an overarching workflow that can at least inform us about what algorithms to use. Uh, uh, ideally, the same algorithm in all scenarios, but uh, what algorithms to use in different scenarios is not. Um, beyond that, I think that trying to understand, like, or trying to quantify, like, oh, are these two spatulas more different than these two spatulas? I um, that that doesn't seem quite as useful to me. I think that the it could be nice for for measuring progress, of course, but uh, I. I'd rather spend more time thinking about solving the problem than uh, uh, and, and making the performance better than trying to uh, trying to measure these things. Because it, it might be just 
it might be ill-defined as well. There's there's scenarios where actually for one system, maybe something is more in distribution because it kind of decided it happened to learn something in one way uh, versus another scenario. And like, it might depend not just on the exact specifics of the scenario, but also what the network learned and, and how it learned it. Thanks. Um, then, uh... Is, is there any of you who would like to comment? Do any of you want to take an opposing view and say, we do need to clearly know, you know, how different is too different for my robot? No, I think I, I think I agree. <laughs> All right, then uh, I wanted to focus attention on Amy. So I know your group has done lots of work on improving distributional robustness. Um, and zero shot generalization by, for example, using techniques from causal inference. Uh, if a model learns the true cause and effect relationships, it will be robust to any serious correlations. And I think that's a really fascinating idea. Um, what are the most exciting and promising insights that you carry with you from that work? And uh, what do you think, where do you think these approaches will lead in the coming years? This is an interesting question. Um, so I, I think like um, a really nice takeaway from the causal inference literature and field for me has been like the notion of invariance, right? Like I, I think we already are aware that um, we can use invariance uh, or like a objective that incorporates invariance to get out of distribution generalization, to get robustness to things. I, 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 I've actually become a bit disenchanted with um, um, the causal inference field because I, I think that there's a lot of like interesting useful takeaways and methods um but I think a lot of it is maybe not as applicable to the robotic setting right like I, I think one interesting um like one reason why the robotic setting is interesting is because uh you like the thing that makes the most sense is to make use of unstructured high dimensional input right like it makes sense to be um taking raw data from rgb cameras from various sensors and i think that's actually the type of data that causal inference doesn't really know what to do with um and i think like trying to learn structured interpretable uh variables uh inputs like from that type of data is just is really difficult. And I'm not sure that it's necessary, especially with how much end to end learning has been improving um, the kind of successes that we've seen out of foundation models. So I would actually say I'm kind of more interested in like other directions. All right, let's start with, uh, well, that, that's great because then to, to move on to some of these other directions is um, uh, Professor Judy Hoffman was presenting to us today about improving distributional robustness with more data. And also, I know that um, her prior work has focused a lot on adapting models to distribution shifts. Uh, you know, robustness is by no means the, the only approach. Um, and how do you reflect on your results in this area? Do you think it will be feasible to, for example, adapt perception models on the fly in robotics applications, or should adaptation and continual learning only occur between longer deployment cycles? Uh, that's a good question. And I guess I view it as all pieces are necessary. So today I only talked about the out-of-the-box robustness just for the sake of time. But in general, I don't expect that there's going to be a single model that works out of the box in all different settings, um, and I, nor kind of should there be, because it might be computationally expensive to uh, run such a model. So instead, I think what makes more sense is what would be ideal is if there was a way to quickly adapt, specialize, maybe even just sub-select what part of the model needs to be run, given some sort of identification scheme um, based off of ideally a very small amount of observations in a new environment. And so what adaptation looks like may be a little different than what it looked like in the past. In the past, perhaps what your goal was to modify an entire model, which requires lots and lots of data to do so, not necessarily conducive to working really quickly or in a continual way. But instead, as we get more and more of these foundation models, as we start to have models that have more kind of out of the box viability, but still not perfect specialization, our goals may change in terms of what we do for adaptation, but I think there should be effort in trying to be able to specialize them 
if for no other reason than to just make sure that you maintain as computationally efficient as possible. Thanks. That's a that's a great comment. Um, I invite uh, Kelsey to to sort of stir the pot. We have heard about you know improving generalization zero shot, and we have heard about adaptation. You know, are they complementary strategies to the same problem? Do they compete in certain regards? Where would you apply which and how uh, do you think about their interrelation? Yeah, I guess I talked about both in my talk. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that I mean I, I think that they're both important, and I think that it, it definitely makes sense to have um to, well to, to try to have something that is very good zero shot. Uh because things that use the broadest data sets have been arguably the most successful on broad distributions. And oftentimes we're seeing models that are generalists actually do better um, and are more robust uh, than models that are specialists because they see broader data from other tasks and other, other kinds of scenarios. So um, I think that's been quite successful. Uh, now, um, I mean, when I talked about adaptation, we were actually adapting by selecting different policies, essentially. And you could also, like, you can do them at the same time. Like, you can have a language condition policy, for example, and then uh, adapt in the space of language in addition to fine tuning parameters. And uh, I, I definitely think that they can be combined. And it seems like robotics is pretty hard. So why not try to throw everything you can at it and, and both use a broad data set and adapt at test time. Um, certainly computational efficiency and computational requirements with these really large models is a concern, uh, especially sometimes for some of these models it's out of the reach of an academic budget. It's most easiest to do on, um, on large like, industry budgets, but not even all industry budgets, like a, a few companies uh, really. So, uh, yeah, so there's definitely challenges um, on that front, but I think that I think that the two strategies are complementary. Then something that we haven't mentioned yet, when we we're talking about adaptation and zero shot generalization, is uh, that in safety critical situations, it is often common to focus on methods of out of distribution detection. So not even try to do well out of distribution, just try to detect these these inputs and, and maybe we can intervene with the system and maintain some kind of safety. Uh, I wanted to focus attention on Rowan and asking your experience in building AV systems. Uh, how do the OD detection methods fit in? What are they even trying to measure? And uh, how do you think about how those methods fit into the story here? Yeah, so I think uh, with with any kind of safety critical system, there's like uh, there's OOD detection, but then there's also can you rein in how much OOD that you're getting? And so currently, you know, one of the strategies that Waymo uses is to geonets. So you get really good at certain areas, and then you just slowly expand rather than trying to expand everywhere all at once. And so that at least reins in the kind of OOD cases that we're presented with, but you can still never get fully away with it. So. Uh, some of the like a lot of the a lot of the research going on at the moment is usually about uh, identifying stuff that we still see it's just kind of rare. Can we mine those rare examples? And so so you know one way in which we do that is um, uh, what we, what we call like difficulty models. So if we have like an ensemble of different models that are trained in different geographies. Are they starting to disagree on what to do in this particular scene? In that case that's considered a hard scene uh, if you've got different models disagreeing. So there's a kind of Bayesian slash ensemble flavor there of like, uh, you know, there's at least some action uncertainty about, you know, what to do here. Um, uh, in uh, other, other forms of, uh, uh, you know, example mining is to do with rare. So if we have some kind of density and feature space about a sexual object, uh, if that's got if that's got a high amount of uncertainty, we'll kind of um, uh, help play that. Uh, and then there's other tricks to do with like um, uh, uh, there's a there's a paper called uh, Grad Tail um, that came out last year that we've been using, which is basically saying, look, if you've got any kind of model, uh, you've got a particular uh, single data, um, you want to pass that through the model, and you've got some kind of regression or classification. Yeah. task, you know, what is the gradient of the parameters of whatever model you're looking at? And if that differs through the dot product from the average batch, then that's considered a very interesting data that is then, again, upweighed 
So it's mainly through upwind um, data that we see at the edges of the tail um, and, and making sure it's, uh, it's, it's more common, at least from the models. I think what I wanted to bring up next is the topic of foundation models in robotics, right? Today, I think multiple speakers talked about bringing broad generalist knowledge into the system by leveraging techniques like LLMs. Um, to do better zero shot, to do all kinds of things. You mentioned about upweighing data and measuring data that you have as being rare. Is there anything that you see as being changed about these strategies when you bring in large pre-trained models from, from the outside? Yeah, so it, it's really a hot topic in Waymo Foundation models, and uh, and now the White House mentioned it like eighteen times in that um, <laughs> report. And so, so it, it's really caught on, you know, in, inside Waymo as well. Although the, the the funny thing is, is like, so at least within the research group, the, you know, there's this great hope that foundational models will kind of solve a lot of these added distribution problems, but you know, and can be applied to our you know data sets, which are just growing bigger every day. But the, the funny thing about like growing data sets is you just start to see more and more weird stuff. Like, um, you know, the, you know, if you if you've got ten million data, you start to see one out of ten million events, and if you've got a billion data, you start to see one out of a billion events. And like, like we see some crazy stuff. Like some of the slides, I don't know if Drago showed it. Like, there's motorcycles coming down the highway. Uh, but like it's only a motorcycle, and there's no motorcyclist on it, but it's still kind of green and down. Um, some of the, uh, you know, there's there's cases like vehicles on fire, there's houses on the road, like prefabbed houses that are kind of, you know, fairly popular in, in America. Um, and so you, you see all of these, you see all these really interesting things, the larger your data set gets. So uh, yeah, I think, um, I don't know. I, actually, I liked Chelsea's point about like, kind of, you know, using everything we can, like, um, uh, you know, like all sorts of data sets that we can. One of the, one of the really interesting, I think, directions at the moment is like BLMs, because like actually a few days ago, we had a lot of really interesting data with Halloween. Like there's pedestrians dressed up as ghosts and tigers and, and everything. And like, we don't see that that much anymore, but like a lot of the like internal BLM models could say, oh, this is people dressed up as Halloween. They are people, they are pedestrians. Um, so I think that could be a really interesting direction as well. Yeah, I would like to to pass the gavel to Chelsea and and ask you know threading off of this uh, you know, we've here here all across the room and also at one of the earlier workshops today uh, this this sort of comment that you know practically everything is in distribution for a properly trained foundation model and that they could virtually solve the OD problem. Do you do you agree with this or is this going to tail somewhere and run into problems? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I haven't fully played around. Like, I've started to play around a little bit with some of the VLMs, like state-of-the-art VLMs, like GPT-4B. Uh, certainly a lot of open source VLMs are nowhere near the state-of-the-art models. Uh, we've been trying to start to develop things like RT2 with open source models. Um, but I think that the open source models are extremely impressive. Uh, I don't think that everything is in distribution for them, at least from the standpoint of actually, like, like we've given them inputs that they don't do very well at. Uh, one activity that my lab did is uh, we had a, we do have a reading group and the speaker at the last minute couldn't join. And so we had their slides, but we didn't have them. And so we had, uh, we did slideshow karaoke and then also had GPT-4 actually uh, describe all of the slides as well. And some of the slides it's actually really good at and some of the slides it completely could not do as well. Um, but I mean, back to robotics data, the, uh, it, there's some things that it's quite good at and there's some things that, are, uh, that, that aren't quite there yet, I think. So uh, they're really exciting. Uh, I, it's hard to know, well, it's usually not a good idea to bet against these models, I think. Uh, and they're, uh, in the context of robotics, I think they're quite exciting. I don't think they're gonna fully solve the robotics problem. There isn't just, there isn't enough data of, like uh, how to control your fingers to tie your shoes on the internet for these models to be able to to do it, but for the high level aspect of things, uh, I think they're really uh, really mind blowing, and uh, and we should use them to capture their semantic knowledge, to capture their knowledge of planning, um, and so forth. 
I wanted to shift gears a little bit now as we sort of started characterizing the, the different approaches towards the out of distribution problem and you know go beyond these algorithmic elements uh, and I would like to transition to talk about benchmarking. Uh, how do we ensure that the research that we're doing actually scales to increase real world reliability in robotics? Um, like when we have thousands or billions of self-driving vehicles operating at scale. And I first want to invite the two uh, speakers of that we have here today who work in industry, Rowan and Chelsea, to comment about you know how your perspective on the OOD problem has evolved what, uh, in the context of your industry work. And are there things that you think academic research under or over emphasizes that we shouldn't be doing or should be doing more of? You are much more industry than I am. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so sorry, the last, uh, uh, sorry, uh, what was the last one? Yeah, I think other things you think that academic research under mm -hmm. or over emphasizes things we should be doing more of, things that we're not doing enough of. How do we? make academic research more relevant to real world robustness. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, in general, there's a lot of interest in like, how does the ML plug into a system? So like, you know, with at least like the autonomous vehicle, it, it's, you know, you, you put in an ML based plan and it, it exists in an ecosystem of all sorts of other modules. And so like, there's all of these interesting questions at the moment about like, what do you do when you have like time delays? or like variable time delays or dropped packets or like, you know, all of these ways in which ML systems actually interface with a more complicated system and, and the world itself. So I think, uh, you know, and that's definitely not a solved problem within um, uh, Waymo, especially as like, especially when we're so fresh, like replacing certain components with like, uh, with machine learning. With machine learning components, we're just constantly faced with these new questions. You know, how do you how do you interface within you know within a like a, a more complicated um, robotic system? Especially if not every single part of that is some end-to-end -end machine learning system. So, like trying to understand you know upstream, downstream, where are your inputs really coming from? How are they coming in? Uh, and then downstream, how your outputs actually used? What what really matters? in terms of, you know, um, uh, the output quality uh, as a general, yeah. Yeah, so I th the two things that I've learned from kind of a more industry-focused mindset is uh, first, the, the first time I did an internship at Google, I was pretty eager to take some algorithms I had developed during my PhD on a single robot and scale them to a suite of 10 robot arms. Uh, it was a really awesome opportunity. I was like, this will be great. We'll have like large, like all these robots doing this cool stuff. And I realized that once you move from like one robot to 10 robots, which is even, even that much big of a jump in some ways, uh, the algorithms I was working with like wouldn't, wouldn't at all scale, um, in part because they were very complicated. Uh, and it's really the simple things that are easier and like much more feasible to deploy when you have a larger data set, a larger suite of robots and so forth. Um, and so simplicity is really important. And second, the supervision that I was giving to my one baby robot uh, was way more than the supervision I could hope to um, to to give when I was trying to scale. The supervision is what's scalable uh, in terms of like resetting the environment, giving it rewards, setting up the environment in a particular way. Uh, and so simplicity and scalability, I think, are um, are really important uh, for things that are actually going to, I think, have an impact in industry. Uh, this is regardless of whether or not, regardless of you're handling OED distributions or not. Um, and then the second thing I've learned, I think, is um, I, I think that we, as roboticists, we should really be getting to the point where the models that we develop are not just a demo in our lab, but it's actually something that another researcher could download and make use of, whether it generalizes zero shot or could be fine-tuned. And I think that we're, we're starting to get to the point where we can do that. And so um, our like our 3M work of like learning a pre-trained representation for robotics was kind of our first attempt at, at that. And we actually found that people were able to download it and, and fine tune it and get some value over training from scratch. Uh, and now with things like RTX, uh, we're actually able to take a model and, and actually run it at six different institutions and actually have it control the robot with, um, with non-zero success, which is, uh, which is a starting point, I think, for actually having the system be uh, be deployable in the real world. So um, I think that like trying to push towards things that 
uh, that work uh, at other places uh, is is a big thing to, to shoot for as a community. Either. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, actually, if I can, yeah, carry on with it. Like, so I like the simplicity point, and, and, and it did make me think of uh, how, like, like or at least one of my crusades within, like, way my research is to just basically reduce the input space to a lot of these models, because, like, you can have all sorts of things, especially with the, the kind of uh, craze around foundational models, that you can just, you know, bloat your input space to take advantage of all sorts of kind of interesting features that the model may want to condition on, which works well in distribution, but then doesn't necessarily generalize when you, when you get out. A classic example that we've had recently is this question around uh, goals. So like if you have a particular route or a goal that you want the, the autonomous vehicle to go to, that can be an input, but it can also be a cost on the output. And so, you know, by, by removing it from the input space, suddenly you don't have to learn all combinations of here's my scene and here's where I want to go. You just have to learn here's my scene. And then, you know, and then on the output planning, instead of a supervised problem, we can kind of bring in both supervision, but also optimization to say, okay, how would we, you know, end up going to the space within the kind of manifold of um, safe driving behavior. So like limiting the machine learning sometimes, you know, with like, you know, like path planning, ROT star, it's never out of distribution because there is no machine learning about it. It just it just plans in any situation that it's in. So some of like in a lot of situations, you don't need to throw, you don't need to treat everything as a machine learning problem. And just and then just you know, every new piece of information you have expand the input space, you really can in some situations restrict it to the benefit of generalization, not a distribution. I think these are these are some great points, and I think I, I agree that it's great to see these more community-led initiatives to get a robot to work on many different robots, and it also means that the interface needs to be be great and practically applicable across different types of robots. But I wanted to ask Judy specifically. I think we're seeing these trends in benchmarking that are maybe improving in robotics, but of course, computer vision has had a long journey in this in this also, and I want. Wanted to ask you what what lessons or inspiration can we take from what has happened in computer vision and reproducible benchmarking? How we can, uh, you know, what what are specific things that you think might be different for robotics, or how how can we improve? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny listening to this discussion because it's certainly in computer vision benchmarking and reusability and clearing across different labs has helped propel progress substantially. Um, to the point though where the conversations that we're starting to have are do we rely too much on benchmarks and should we be cutting back and should we be testing things that i mean coming from the purpose of this workshop out of distribution like that's part of the the pitfalls that you get with a very static um benchmark that's kind of hammered on by lots and lots of people over and over again is, is you basically start solving the proxy problem that you set up rather than the real problem um and so i think the only lesson and, and i'm not even sure if it's it's needed as much in the robotic space because presumably even if you put it in different labs, even if you control for the same robot, there's gonna be some variability across the labs, which is more than when we have our static image data set, um, which could help you to identify um, kind of uh, any, any sort of overly simplistic assumptions that you set up in the benchmark. But basically, the only takeaway is just um, benchmarks are, are great. They help a lot. Reusability helps a lot. But uh, don't forget that um, that is a problem that was set up to be able to measure progress in the community and not the overall problem. I think with, with that, that statement, I wanted to ask Amy as well that in, in robotics research, it's really common to develop algorithms with a specific application in mind. You know, maybe we can represent the geometry of objects in a different way so that it generalizes better to new types of objects. But given your experience in developing general purpose algorithmic advancements for robustness, you know, is, is this state of the practice fine? Do we need to move towards benchmarking? Do we need to keep the you know benchmarking across different robots, across different types of problems to validate these algorithmic robustness interventions? Or as as you were saying, we shouldn't forget about the, the practical things that you were initially focused on. How do you think about this? So 
My, I think with my answer, my bias as a reinforcement learning and algorithms person first, as opposed to roboticist. And I, I think I might need to give a caveat that I am really not a roboticist. I've never touched a real robot. Um, so keep that in mind um, as I give my answer. And, and I think like for me, I, whether or not we should be using benchmarking versus, you know, like, like testing in the wild, it really has to do with the maturity of the technology. And in robotics, like it's, it's a particularly messy thing because robotics spans so many different scenarios, problem settings, tasks that um, I, I do think that there's still a lot to be done on the algorithm side. I think that there are like isolated problems that we really understand are hard and why they're hard, which means that like, like you know, there's a lot we can still do with benchmarks and in simulation that allow us to, um, uh, you know, continue building reproducible research, um, continue trying to understand and interpret the issues that we're facing and like devise algorithms to solve them. I So I guess like my answer is, you know, I, I think in RL, I, I will say, I think there, there have been a lot of issues in the RL community where we focus too much on toy problems, on erroneous assumptions, like the, like as an example, um, part of the mark of the MDP assumption is that we have access to some nice dense reward function. Um, it was only after I learned more about robotics that I understood how naive of an assumption that is and how difficult reward shaping actually is. Um, and so so I, I think like, you know, staying in algorithm land, staying in simulation land absolutely absolutely does harm in terms of understanding like what are the important directions. But I, I think that there's still a lot we can do with, careful design of simulated environments and simulated benchmarks to isolate specific problems like generalization problems um, that where, you know, we can still make a lot of progress. With, with that being said, I think I, I wanted to ask Chelsea, you know, as, as a point of final debate, you know, do we need a wild data set for robotics? Do we need a wild style benchmark for robotics? Yeah, I mean, overall, I'm, I'm, it's always very happy with the wild work because it, it uh, for a number of reasons, because I think it, it, it pushed people towards like, like a lot of the distribution shift benchmarks in supervised learning uh, were extremely synthetic. And we actually went out and talked to domain experts about the kind of distribution shift challenges they had. Uh, it also highlights the, the data set, kind of a secondary goal of the data set was actually not just to focus on natural image classification or text classification, but to have a more diverse, or have more diversity in terms of the domains that people study, uh, to include satellite images, to include um, like uh, molecular graphs and so forth. So uh, that I think is also very nice about the WILDS data set. Um, in general, I think that benchmarking in robotics is, is challenging. Uh, in part because the um, the evaluation is not is not just uh, a single time step. You you need to look at how the system is behaving over time, uh, and we want to do these evaluations in the real world uh, that are in ideally lots of different real worlds and so forth. So I think that simulations have a place in terms of uh, in in terms of allowing us to formulate concrete hypotheses and test things, and we use simulations all the time to validate our ideas and to understand what's what the algorithm is doing in the first place. Uh, I think creating uh, benchmarks that capture the challenges of real world robotics is really hard. And real world robots are just like a lot more challenging than simulations uh, in, in a variety of ways. So. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I don't know if it's possible to create the, the wilds of robotics in, in many ways um, because of that, because of that. So I think I've, we've heard a lot of great agreement between all the speakers here today, but I invite you to offer up a hot take or something, <laughs> something that maybe you think um, might be an uncommon viewpoint on, on some of the problems in 
in benchmarking and in out of distribution generalization that we talked about today. I, I will give one thing that I would like to see. This is an area that um, I don't know a lot about yet. So I welcome kind of everyone to give their thoughts and opinions on this and whether or not it's feasible. Um, you know, I, I think that there's been great trends in terms of creating offline real robot data sets. Um, my group is playing around with RTX and very excited about it. And we were talking about evaluation. So, you know, I, I understand the limitations of using simulators for um, evaluation in online environments, but maybe it's time to explore how we could use offline policy evaluation using real robot data. I don't know if this is reasonable or not, but I kind of just get the sense that the more data that we have, the larger variety and diversity of offline robot data that we have, maybe the more feasible offline policy evaluation will be. Anyone care to respond? I guess I can respond by saying that every try, every time I've tried to do any sort of off policy or offline policy evaluation, it has completely failed. Uh, and so I I wish that Amy will succeed in, in her endeavor because that would be amazing. I, I think that offline policy evaluation is just uh, it would be so valuable to have something like that, uh, but it's also been extremely challenging in my experiences. That said, I haven't tried that hard, so um, maybe maybe people can try harder. Uh, one thing that I am excited about is I would love to see people who don't touch real robots to actually play around with RTX and to use it and train policies with it, test our offline algorithms on it. And um, one project that we're working on, maybe I shouldn't make any promises because it's like pretty early stages, but we're trying to make um, actually a simulation-based evaluation for testing policies trained on RTX and for testing policies trained on real data. Uh, we're hoping that that might, it's not going to be a perfect benchmark, but we're hoping that that will allow um, to get, give us a little bit of the best of both worlds of like evaluating policies on real data, like trained on real data, and also giving the benefits of simulation in terms of reproducibility, in terms of being able to run lots of different experiments and trials and so forth. Uh, and we have some signs that we're able to train policies on real data and actually run them in, in a in a somewhat realistic simulator, um, at least for some tasks. And so uh, it might provide a, a benchmark solution, possibly, but it's still pretty early stages and uh, it's an ongoing research project. Uh, that being said, I think we're running quite over time. We also started the panel late, but I, I think we can take a few questions from the audience and then uh, move on. Is there anyone who would like to ask? You know, I have a, a question for Professor uh, Angel. So, you have been doing some abstraction uh, works for reform on the side, and now you are trying to deploy it to some uh, real world. So, is there any possibility, or to which extent do you think that the current world learning policies should abstract uh, to to which level that we can like, start to consider some synergies between uh, these classical methods? Say planning and control, task planning and planning uh, to some learning based approach for like a whole global system. You can use data information for some representation to uh, have all these classical methods to have a nice uh, method that's more like with better guarantee on the real world. I caught like half of that was the question about using learned representations and abstractions with like classical planning and control methods and like what kind of like, like, what kind of like to which level or at which extent do you think like these abstractions should lie in that we can actually apply them in this and also like similar questions for uh, speakers uh, yeah, like in person, maybe you can. Yeah, so, so uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I noticed you've done a lot of uh, uh, like works on the abstractions for reinforcement learning before. So, so now you mentioned that it is a little bit 
two like toy examples that we just deploy them in the simulator. So in terms of the some real world applications, so do you think that we can still reuse some similar spirits as those abstraction, like both in action or state or the transition dynamics, uh, but uh, try to abstract them to a certain level and then uh, like apply some classical like robotics, like searching planning based approach to 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 make it try to create some synergies between the two, and Absolutely. if so, if you are right, if so, so which which extent, which extent, which level do you think it is appropriate way to 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 synergize that two? Yeah, that okay. I I mean that is an open research question, right? Like I think this is why hierarchical RL is so intriguing. But we you know we haven't made a lot of progress, but it would be really awesome if we had like a like a really good concrete definition for what levels of hierarchy should be so that allows us to like learn those abstractions and then allows us to do search and planning at that level. Um, actually, I have a postdoc right now who I co-supervise with Peter Stone um, and we've been exploring this question exactly of, of you know, is there, a, is there like a more, is there a concrete classical definition of abstraction that we can um, use for this? Um, I guess I don't, I don't really have like a more, more coherent explanation or response than that. Um, other than like, yes, I think this is a really interesting direction. And yes, I think this is also is still a very open and hard problem. So, you know, I invite everybody to think about it. We take one more question from the audience and yes, please come, come up and, and ask the question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the definition of uh, open set uh, detection, because yeah, maybe mainly for for Roham, um, yeah, because uh, why I ask this because um, uh, during the previous presentation from uh from uh Remo, so like uh, so he used the open vocabulary uh, object detection as the definition of open set detection, uh, which is like not very precise because I think like the, um, maybe a more formal definition of open set uh, detection should be um, the ability of detecting what uh, the model doesn't know. Uh, if we have this uh, large scale model like foundation model or this VLM or LM, which has been chained uh, with a massive um, of data, and then we can say that we don't have the problem of the OD detection, and then we, we use this as the definition of op, uh, open set detection. So I, it's um, not that uh, correct, I think. So yeah, to to like summarize, so I am, so there are currently like maybe uh, possibly two definitions for this open set detection. One is uh, to use the open uh, vocabulary uh, object detection as the uh, open set detection, because we can uh, specify anything like any objects. Uh, There's one definition and another one is that we can still use the maybe uh, a small uh, object detection or, or any model uh, which has been chained on a small scale of data, but it has the ability to detect uh, what it doesn't know. So yeah, this is my questions. What do you think maybe? Because this represents like uh, two direction of uh, research in the long term, yeah. Um, yeah, if we choose the first one, we use this, uh, this open vocabulary uh, detection as the definition of open set detection that maybe we need more powerful foundation model. But if we choose the second one, maybe we need to put more focus on the maybe uncertainty estimation, or the detection capability. Yes. Yeah, actually, I, I know nothing about um, <laughs> perceptual. So yeah, I, I wish Marco was here um, because yeah, that's that's kind of what he specializes in. But uh, I've been mainly on the prediction planning side um, that um, kind of often deals downstream with some of these these kinds of questions. But uh, but yeah, I mean, like a lot of the work that I've seen come out um, in the last year or so has, has has just been in terms of like kind of capturing certain objects and treating them, you know, as a special case online, um, you know, if they uh, if they add a distribution in, in some way, 
um, you know, whether that's like according to, you know, our difficulty model, according to some feature space that we know we haven't seen them that much at all, some featureization. So like often you get really, like sometimes you can find some weird geometry vehicles. Um, and so then that will be, you know, that will have some unique featureization. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I could give you a better answer. I, I don't know. And there's also open questions for yeah. all of the speakers, yeah. Very cool. Open question entirely. I know, I know, but, oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Like, like open stack detections do really to, um, like equip the model with the ability to know uh what it doesn't know. Like, or we just train the model with, like the universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I think that actually goes back to one of the very first questions that we had on our channel about even measuring distribution. So. Oh, do you like? Do you define that on a distributional level? Do you define that on an instance level? It kind of depends on on what your definition is. So, if it's distributional level, then maybe you can have enough time to gather enough data and actually use one of these techniques we have to measure distances and decide whether or not you're going to work. But that's really dissatisfying if you then that means that you were kind of like failed in the meantime and didn't know about it. Um, so it seems like from a more safety critical perspective, usually for OOD detection, what you care more about is the instantaneous OOD. Like you, it's almost more of a calibration issue. You want to make sure that your prediction knows something about their own uncertainty. Um, and uh, what we have found is that doing that under the settings where everything is changing about your input is especially hard. Um, so. I think there there needs to be more study into how do you how do you make sure that a, a model retains its calibration as the inputs change. Yes, I, I will say like the the way that we use like the difficulty model, which is the disagreement between like a set of planners. I think it's I think it's a better way to think about what OOD which OOD matters because mm -hmm. there's plenty of OOD stuff that just does not matter. Like if there's a pedestrian like four hundred meters behind us doing like walking faster than a pedestrian normally does. And maybe mm -hmm. it's because they're on like one of those like one wheel skateboards that you can't really see. Um, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't affect what the vehicle is going to do next. Whereas if there's a pedestrian right in front of the vehicle, that mm -hmm. anything OOD there matters a whole lot more. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess like just because something's OOD doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be solved um, or that it matters. Um, but like identifying which OOD matters with respect to the ultimate control of the robot is the thing that really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're going a little bit over time, uh, depending, you know, it's the last item on the program. So I, I hope you guys don't have something to run, run off to ask. <laughs> but I wanted to maybe tie up the discussion and conclude a little bit. And I'm wondering, we started off this workshop with sort of the idea that when we develop robot learning algorithms, we're always plagued by reliability issues when the robots see out of distribution things. How do we unblock ourselves and, and build really reliable robots for the real world? In what you've seen today, do you feel like hopeful? Are we going to get there? Are we going to build reliable robots that, that can manage in situations uh, that they haven't seen before? Or is this always going to be a problem that we're going to be dealing with? Um, just a, a real question for anyone who would like to jump in. I think it's the aspects of both. I think I'm hopeful in the sense that the we're starting to actually have much larger data sets. Obviously, there's internet data, but one thing I didn't talk about in my talk is uh, like we're starting to have actually large amounts of robot data, including in many different scenes. Or there, um, there's uh, a new cross embodiment data set that has a million uh, trajectories and more than 200 scenes. I've also been, we have an ongoing data collection effort that has more than 600 scenes in it. And so I think that we're starting to get to the point where we can have robots be, uh, robot arms be more reliable by using broader data. Uh, and of, of course, in places like navigation and driving, we also already have uh, pretty diverse data as well. And we can start to get systems that can do something flexible, like the deployed Waymo cars. So I think I'm hopeful from that standpoint. And I think the fewer things will be OOD once you have broader data. Uh, and so I'm quite hopeful in that sense. I think also at the same time, there's always going to be things like there's always edge cases that are going to come up, and um, and it'll keep us on our toes. 
All right, with that being said, uh, does anyone care to respond? Otherwise, I'm, I'm happy I, to wrap it up. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, these these issues are always going to come up. And so at, at least, like, the more they deflect, the more you see. So I, I think as far as this workshop is concerned, you've got a bright future. Another <laughs> <laughs> five years, you can. <laughs> I'll just add one quick thing, which is just to say, again, outsider here, but um, I, I've seen a lot of effort also in coming up with more flexible ways to collect data, which seems like the way to go to me because um, kind of the old style of it needing to be only collecting on robot in a particular setting is really cumbersome. Um, at Georgia Tech, there's an effort, I'm sure that there's efforts at Stanford and all these other places too um, that are, are trying to see what's the more flexible way that they can deal with human demonstrations. There's, um, I've seen people trying to find teleoperation uh, as a way to collect extra data um, or using VR in various different ways. And I think exploration on all these paths makes tons of sense. It's really cumbersome to select the data. And so you're gonna have trouble scaling. So working in, in trying to find ways to leverage all of the advances of technology from other adjacent fields seems promising to me. Yeah, I think I'm going to say one thing as well, which is, you know, I think there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on the data and I kind of wanted to just <laughs> bring my talk back in um, and say that, you know, I think we've left behind like a lot of aspects of structure. And I think, you know, something that we're also brushing over is like a lot of the design decisions into what have made even foundation models work, like how we do tokenization, the architecture of models, all of that is leveraging structure in the data. And so I, I think we're we're not giving structure enough credit. And I think, you know, right now there's a lot of low hanging fruit we can do with scale, with foundation models, but at some point, I guess this is like the whole like crotchety older researcher um, coming in. At some point, we're gonna hit the limits of what we can achieve uh, with scale. And there's a lot of problem settings where we're not gonna get away with just scale, right? There's always gonna be OOD. Um, and so I think leveraging structure, leveraging classical methods, leveraging, um, you know, uh, guarantees is something that we're going to have to do for that kind of like very long tail distribution. So if there are no, nobody wants to respond to that, I think um, I am happy to adjourn for today. We have some closing remarks. Uh, and then I would like to thank you all for joining the, the panel discussion today. I hope you found the discussion insightful and, and you learned something in terms of perspective. And I wish the same for the audience, of course. Um, and then we will we will adjourn.